speed read to make sure that I get this right. Third piece of information is to say that I need to make sure that I'm speaking close enough to the mic so that you can all hear me. So there are many other pieces of information, but let's get going because we have an exciting morning. Thank you for being here. This is a really big part of the meeting for us. I'm Holmes, President of the American College of Cardiology. I'm an interventional cardiologist. And, and this morning, this is the first press conference. It's going to be on select featured clinical research. And our first presentation will be the two late-breaking clinical trials that we opened with. They're going to be very interesting. They're going to be very provocative. Things that you need to know about will be things about process of care, about the scientific questions, whether we answered the scientific questions, and then the relevance to practice, risk-benefit ratio sort of things. How does it fit? And then, most importantly, probably of all, is to question about what it means for the future, future studies to answer the questions that are raised by these studies. Doug Weaver is here, past president of the American College of Cardiology, to also be available. We'll have plenty of time for questions. There is a call-in period afterwards. We want to make sure that we get your questions answered so that we can put this in perspective. Because again, I re-emphasize the fact that this is a really important thing for our patients, that you're here us that you're here because you make a big difference for us. Emerson is going to be the first presenter. He's the director of clinical research for the cardiovascular medicine at the Texas Heart Institute. He presented the paper today. You can all read it. It's the effect of trans endocardiomatologous bone marrow mononuclear cell delivery on functional capacity, that particular function and perfusion in the chronic ischemic heart failure patient. Fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, there's an acronym called FOCUS. So we can remember FOCUS. I can't remember any of the other words. But Emerson can tell us about the study. studies and one of them has been uh, uh, published last year and this is the second study to be presented there will be another study presented later on this year so this is a very important step uh, this study that we presented today is sort of a um, it's been preceded by two other studies and that's where the, the focus name comes in uh, the study immediately preceding this one was a 30 patient study called uh, focus HF and that stands for uh, first autologous coronary cell study in heart failure in the U.S. Um, so the present study really expanded upon uh, the other previous, the phase one study and, and, and focus HF, which was an initial phase two study. And as a phase two study implies, this is an exploratory type of study. So we're trying to understand what are findings, what these findings mean, and how we can apply this. Because stem cell therapy is not something that we're at the end of the road. And, and with many other kinds of therapy in cardiovascular disease, we know endpoints, we know what to ask, we understand what we're trying to get. Well, with stem cell therapy, we really don't even know what the right endpoint, for example, is. And so you can see in this trial, actually, we um, picked endpoints rather ambitiously. If we had picked an endpoint of left ventricular ejection fraction, this would have been a positive study a priori, because the three endpoints that we did pick um, were not significantly changed. But I really um, probably want to bring to you that that is not so important in this case, because it really showed us, uh, well, we need to pay, be paying attention to left ventricular ejection fraction when we do uh, further studies. The other thing that the study uh, brought to us, and so in, in, 
in summary, it's, it's, there's 92 patients, 61 treated, um, uh, 31 were, uh, were control patients, but it was a, a, a really a double-blind study. So the patients, it was performed very rigorously. So the patients that got, that were in the control group that really didn't get uh, the active treatment, they went through the exact same procedure that had injection of something into their heart. It just didn't contain cells. And the product that, or the cells that we used in this study were autologous bone marrow cells. And autologous means from your own body. So um, this is sort of the first uh, generation, let's say, of cell product, and it's been one of the most studied clinically. It's, you have to start somewhere. This seems like a really good starting point to start cell therapy. And as it sort of we hinted to in Focus HF, there is a very large variation in your own cells depending on how you are. So it's very different. Cell therapy is very different in that instead of giving a fixed dose of an aspirin, let's say you give somebody you know, 81 milligrams of aspirin, you're giving everybody the same treatment. Well, in autologous cell therapy, we're learning, and this study has really taught us as well, and really pointed the direction, actually, that when we give this uh, autologous cell therapy, it depends. The potency of the, the cells, or the medicine in this case, really depends on the individual. And so we found that younger patients responded significantly, and but independently, we saw that there were certain cell types that made the ingestion fraction go up. So. Uh, cells with a surface marker called CD34 and CD133. They're both endothelial cell surface markers. These are, these are endothelial progenitor cells. They're cells that are going to constitute uh, blood vessels. And so we saw a relationship between the presence of these kinds of cells and clinical benefit, improvement in injection fraction. And then we also saw another parameter of function, which is called endothelial colony forming in uh, uh, cells. And you can see that there's a kind of common theme here because in endothelial colonies, there's different kinds of cells. And there's probably the CD133 cells in there, there's CD34 cells in there. But there's other kinds of cells, maybe CD14. And, and we have, and this is a very important aspect of the study, we have a biorepository where we have sent all the samples from all the patients. And so these first things that I'm telling you about today, this is a late breaking trial, is sort of the first analysis of looking at this. But there, I can guarantee you that there will be more data coming from this because we have a, a treasure trove of, uh, of, of cells from all the patients and we can really dive a lot, we've kind of scratched the surface and now we're gonna proceed in diving a lot deeper and understanding the different, uh, teasing out these cell functions in, trying to correlate them with many of these other endpoints. And maybe these endpoints were, you know, the ones that I presented today uh, weren't positive because we pre-specified the three primary endpoints, but we may find things that we don't know yet, that a certain cell type or patients that have this or have that may actually have a benefit in a, in a clinical endpoint that we're not expecting. So this is the kind of important thing and a, and a really central role that um, the study the network has in having created this biorepository and, and, and we performed these trials, seen the results, and now are, are, are ready to move forward. And, and in the process, we've learned a lot about um, autologous bone marrow, uh, bone marrow cell therapy in this very sort of sick patient population. This is very different than acute MI. These are patients that are chronically ill, that don't have an option for uh, surgery or, or getting a stent. They really uh, need something, and, and we can't heart transplant everybody, and there's not an LVAD for everybody. So this is a population that we really need to find solutions to treat them with. Thanks, Emerson. The way this is going to work is that we're going to have the, the four different presentations. We'll keep them short and concise, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. We see Pat Garrett just came in to help with the discussion. So David is going to talk next, um, who is director of the, the Beating Cardiac Unit of the Cardiovascular Division of Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Morrow is the senior investigator with the Timmy Study Group and associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He's going to be talking about the second late late trial from this morning, which is evaluation of a novel antiplatelet agent for secondary prevention of patients with atherosclerotic disease results from the the receptor antagonist and secondary prevention of atherothrombotic ischemic events. 
So Dr. Mahomes asked me to just give my comments from here, so please let me know if I have any difficulty hearing. I think the results of the TRA2P TIMI 50 trial uh, are very clear and very exciting to us. Uh, they advance the field, we think, in three major areas. The first is that this is the birth of a brand new class of platelet blockers. Um, second, this is the first proof that we have that we can improve antiplatelet treatment uh, on top of aspirin in patients with a previous heart attack. The third is that this is, I think, the last straw challenging a very common concept, for, particularly for cardiologists, that all atherosclerosis should be treated in the same way. And so let me walk you through those in a little bit more detail. First, expand on the first two together. So as Dr. Brownell pointed out at the beginning of the session, there's still more than a million patients who have a new heart attack in the United States each year. And we typically treat those patients with lifestyle modifications, platelet low, or cholesterol lowering medications, blood pressure lowering agents, and platelet blockers. Still, almost 15% of them each year will be hospitalized for another complication of their atherosclerosis. Now when we look at the tremendous advances that we've made in drug therapy over the past several decades, it's remarkable that our antiplatelet therapy for this group of patients, the stable patient with the previous heart attack, hasn't changed. We have no new evidence that anything else has done any better. So from a perspective of antiplatelet treatment, we've really been left with just aspirin in this particular setting um, until now. And the TRA2P uh, trial shows, I think, conclusively that this new class of platelet blockers does reduce recurrent arterial clotting events, particularly myocardial infarction, in patients with a previous heart attack. And the finding that it does that on top of aspirin uh, is very important uh, clinically, because it really changes an area of uncertainty for us right now. Overall, I think the most impactful finding is the 20% reduction in cardiovascular death and lung stroke, so cardiac death, heart attack, uh, blood clotting in the brain uh, with, uh, with this blocking this particular pathway. There's been a very rich science investigating and showing the importance of thrombin uh, in meeting recurrent events for patients with heart disease. But it's really been unclear to this point as to whether blocking this pathway would turn, a, turn out to be advantageous for our patients. And we see now that it, it reduces climbing events. On the third point, um, you know, there's a, a common notion that really became popularized five to 10 years ago, that if you had atherosclerosis in your heart, your brain, or the vessels leading to your extremities, that the treatment was exactly the same. And I think certainly there are common threads in terms of what causes the disease and the risk factors for progression. But we've seen now from our trial and several others that the natural history in those patients is actually different. And also that now I think rather definitively that, um, that antiplatelet therapy is more complex and it's not a one size fits all across the whole group. So last I think we have to talk about safety. And I think overall our findings show that if Vorpaxo were to become clinically available, it's not an agent for all patients with atherosclerosis. Just like any other potent platelet blocker that we use, uh, we need to select patients where we think there's an appropriate balance of the potential benefit versus the risk. And I think that we have been able to identify uh, simple, demographic historical factors that allow us to identify a group of patients where those reductions in clotting events, the benefit there outweighs the smaller absolute risk in bleeding uh, that occurs with these more prompt agents and in particular with Vorpaxar in this trial. Uh, and so um, overall, uh, uh, these aren't factors that have just come from TRA2P from this particular trial. These are things that we know about, we already use in our practice based on a decade of clinical trials of antithrombotics. And so, Matt, we think that this really is an important advance forward scientifically for the field with respect to antiplatelet therapy uh, and also particularly uh, encouraging findings with respect to this particular pathway. 
Thanks, David. That was great. I, I realized that I'm a huge goof because I contacted such a big part of this. And so I had David sit here and rather than come up here. And so we're going to change that around. So I apologize for that. We're going to move on and talk about two featured clinical research investigators who presented research. It's not part of the opening session, but was presented simultaneously in another session. These are terribly important things. Axel Linke was a Professor of Cardiology at the University of Leipzig Heart Center in Leipzig, Germany is going to present the results of an incredibly interesting trial, the International Multi-Center Advanced Study. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. <coughs> Thank you all aware of the fact that transcatheterotic valve implantation and enables treatment of aortic stenosis without open heart surgery. And about 300,000 patients worldwide require aortic valve are being replaced. I think you also have all heard about the partner trial that has been shown that um, transcatheter aortic valve implantation is superior to conventional medical therapy in those that are considered inoperable, and it has been shown to be non-inferior to conventional aortic valve replacement in those that are high risk in a randomized controlled trial. However, um, randomized controlled trials have certain advantages but also certain disadvantages. And what we are lacking today is a real world population of patients with significant aortic stenosis that are high risk. And this was really the focus of the advanced study. So we were planning to evaluate the efficacy and safety of transcatheter aortic valve implantation using a metronic core valve system in a real world patient population. And those patients had to be inoperable or high risk or frail. And this decision was based on the, on the local heart. So a um, total number of 46 centers all across Europe and Southern America and Central Asia contributed to this trial. And a total number of more than 1,000 patients had been treated with the system. So our procedure was extremely safe. This is um, the first take home message. Uh, with regard to complications, we didn't have a single or annual valve rupture that has been seen with other kind of hot valves. We just had one conversion to conventional surgery. I think this is extremely good. And keep in mind the average age of the patient population. We were talking about people that are approximately 81 years of age. About 50% of those patients were female and they were highly symptomatic before the intervention, the shortness of breath, according to New York on session cost, we informed about 80%. So they dramatically improved by the procedure. Already at one month, they felt a lot better. It's now 80% um, only having mild symptoms during exercise. <laughs> procedure was extremely efficient, with 98% of the, of the patients being effectively treated with a valve in the right spot, no requirement of a further intervention. And basically, this good procedural results <clears throat> uh, led to low mortality rate that was about 4.5% at 30 days, and we had a mortality rate of less than 13% at six months follow-up. And I think this is extraordinary. <clears throat> In addition, you, you have learned from partner that stroke might be an issue, and I think in this patient population, it doesn't help if the valve is replaced, when the patient is being unable to walk because of a major stroke. Fortunately, the stroke rate was extremely low. It was 2.9% at one month follow-up, and it was less than 3.5% at the six months follow-up. So in summary, in this real-world population, implantation of the Medtronic covalve prostasis was extremely safe. It was associated with an improvement in hemodynamics, especially in valve function of the aortic valve. And this occurred in the presence of a low mortality rate, a low stroke rate, early after procedure at six months, at one month, and also at later time points at six months follow-up. And uh, this, this were basically is a summary of the uh, the advanced study, and thank you for your uh, for your attention. Thanks, that was great. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the fourth one before we open it up for discussion. Now we have Dr. Joseph Rohn-Zubo from Quebec. 
of the Heart Institute, where he's director of the Cardiac Catheterization Interventional Laboratories. He's going to present the long-term outcomes following transcatheter aortic valve replacement implantation, insights from prognosis uh, factors and valve durability from the Canadian multi-center experience. As you may know, transcatheter open valve replacement has emerged as the treatment of choice in non-operable patients with severe symptomatic valve stenosis, and it seems to be also a good alternative to surgery in those considered to be at high surgical risk. However, most data on TAVR today has been limited to acute and one year follow-up, and very few that exist on the outcomes beyond the one year follow-up. Also, several factors have been identified as uh, the prognostic factors of early and mid-term one-year outcomes following TBR, but very few that exist on the factors determining worse outcomes and the longer term follow-up. Also, the proper evaluation of transcatheter valve durability at long-term follow-up is one of the most important factors determining the potential expansion of this technology towards younger and lower risk patients. While TAVR is usually associated with excellent hemodynamic results, very few data exist on the long-term durability of transcatheter valves. And importantly, the echo data available to date have been mainly obtained from single center or multi-center registries, but without central echo core lab evaluation of the cardiographic findings. Up to now, only the partner trial, trial has provided an echo data obtained from a central echo core lab. And there has been also significant variability in the number of patients evaluated over time, precluding a real paired analysis of all these echo exams over time. Therefore, the objective of our study were to evaluate the long-term outcomes of patients included in the multicenter Canadian experience study with a special focus on the prognostic factors of vulnerability. The multicenter Canadian experience on TAVR Included 339 page, consecutive patients from the wet TAVR with the balloon expandable Edward valve under the Compassionate Clinical Use Program approved by Health Canada. Half of these patients were treated by the Scamble approach, half by the Zepical approach, and most of them received the Edward Sanitary. The median, uh, uh, the acute and one year results of, of this study were already published. In uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2010, and the present study extends the follow-up up to a median of three years, uh, ranging from one up to six year follow-up. And um, uh, the follow-up was available in 99% of the study population. Importantly, the echo data were evaluated in a central echo core lab at the Quebec Lung Institute, an echo core lab directed by Dr. Philippe Varo and John Dominion, and only patients with echoes performed at the participating centers and with serial echoes over time were analyzed. The main results of this study showed that up to 43% of the patients had died at a median follow up of three years following the TABR procedure. This is a survival rate of 57% after a median follow up of three years. Importantly, the causes of late death, the patients who survived the perpetual period, the main causes of late death were non cardiac uh, in more than two thirds of the patients, mostly respiratory causes and uh, chronic renal failure. 27% of the patients died lately because of a cardiac death, mostly cardiac failure. Some patients died because of a sudden, had a sudden death, others myocardial infarction and 7% of the patients had a death of a known origin. Therefore, it's not surprising to see that the main predictors of late mortality in this cohort of patients were mostly non-cardiac comorbidities that were present at uh, baseline before the procedure, such as chronic pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, atrial fibrillation, frail. Most patients who had a cardiac death during the follow-up period said he died because of cardiac failure. And in this group of patients, uh, pulmonary hypertension and, and chronic kidney disease were the main factors determining a 
higher risk for cardiac death uh, in the uh, late period. Importantly, there were only two cases of endocarditis requiring valve explantation at month 7 and 13 after the index procedure. And one of these uh, patients died in the post-operative period for valve implantation. But there were no cases of a structural valve failure during the follow-up period requiring valve explantation. When you look at the stroke that we saw that uh, we had a stroke rate of 2.3% at 30 days. And after this period, the stroke rate up to 4 year follow-up was of about 1.5% per year. It seems to be uh, a stroke rate quite reasonable for this very old and very sick population. Finally, when we look at the echo data, at, uh, we performed serial echo data, we analyzed echo data serially in at one, two, and three year follow up in 158, 86, 34, and 11 patients, respectively. And we showed uh, that the hemodynamic improvement that we obtained immediately after the procedure was stable over time, over three and four year follow up, for the data at four year follow up as to be interpreted with caution because only 11 patients had serial echoes up to these uh, four uh, years. This improvement in valve dynamics translated the improvements in uh, functional status, and these improvements in functional status remained stable up to uh, this median follow up of uh, three years. I think that the, uh, uh, this study provides interesting, uh, interesting insights on all these risk factors that determine uh, uh, this worst prognosis during the uh, follow up uh, period and suggest that a more careful evaluation and follow-up of the patients with these important comorbidities might be associated with better mid to, mid to long term of cancer in these patients. And the present study also shows that bowel function it seems to be stable at least until three years from back. However, we have to continue to follow these patients to, to perform echoes here to these patients in order to obtain data on bowel durability at longer term. Joseph, that was great. We now have four papers, very different papers, that are going to be open for discussion. Again, Doug Weaver and Pat O'Hara are here to help with the discussion. And it is now open. I'd like to have you come to the microphone and identify yourself, where you're from, and then talk about the questions, whether they be process questions, whether they be results questions, whether they be applications. Questions. Everything is fair game, and I think you now need to put them on the spot. Uh, Mitchell's old cardiology news talk bar. Um, so, if uh, Vorapexor would be approved, would you then use it without qualification in patients with a history of MI, no history of stroke, uh, and weight of 60 kilograms or more? I think that would be a reasonable population where overall our data would suggest that that group did very well with respect to the benefit versus the risk. So in that group in particular, um, there was a reduction in cardiovascular mortality, a lowering in stroke of any cause, um, and a significant reduction in myocardial infarction. So I do think that just reflecting on even the way I might use it in practice, that that would be a reasonable group. Anybody else? Well, I, I think there are some intriguing additional findings even in peripheral arterial disease where, although they didn't benefit on the major vascular endpoints, uh, there are other outcomes that we're starting to examine now where we would need to look further. And so I think there is still potential, but based on, on this sort of first look at this enormous amount of data, that's the group where I think there's the most clear balance of benefit versus risk. And two other things about that. You showed an age interaction. Does that play into the use? And uh, do you have for that specific group a number needed to treat, a number needed to harm? Yeah, so I think it's best reflected by the balance of them uh, are best reflected by the, uh, the net clinical outcome. They <coughs> integrate both. And so uh, overall, we saw um, the 16% 16, 16 improvement uh, when we take those without stroke. Um, without 
previous cerebrovascular disease and uh, normal body weight, so to speak. And the age also adds a little bit, so that group uh, tends to do even better with a greater reduction in that clinical outcome with respect to that endpoint. And also on the broader one that includes more moderate levels of bleeding, also a significant improvement. I do think that for, for me in my practice, age, age plays a role with, with all anticoagulant agents, both anticoagulant agents, so I likely to consider it as well. Great. Next. No, Roger Silver, Dr. Brown, um, the session is more like, um, if you could chunk the audio each uh, discussant on how strongly they said is on the negative, um, um, like this, ending with Rob uh, Taylor, on um, really is on the um, And using a criteria not of scientifically interesting, not of we found it might be helpful in with EF in simulation 1062, but using the criteria of what should the public know about on stem cell treatment in terms of things that could help them soon, should we report this to the public at this point, or should we wait? One well, question. That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there always are uh, skeptics. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that cell therapy and regeneration therapy is, is one of the great avenues in the future of treatment of medicine, not only cardiology. Um, we can create blood vessels, we can create tissues, and we're all made of stem cells, so it's just a matter of figuring it out. Now, we're at the very beginning of doing all of this. I think this trial that we presented today is a very important step because we at the network and all over the country, where we are planning um, next studies. And so right now, no, there's, it's not like, oh, this medicine got approved and now you can come and get it. But there are, this will help to build future trials that will now, and I'm not talking hypothetically, I'm talking next month, the month after, we'll be starting trials that will stand on the shoulders of this trial. And, and so I think in that regard, it's, it's very important for what we're doing. The people that seek these trials are, this is not somebody that comes off the street and has a heart attack and all of a sudden he's faced with having to have some treatment. These are patients, in this case, that have had heart failure for years. They've been bypassed once, twice. They've had 20 stents. Uh, there's nothing else to do. They've gone on the internet. They know everything about heart failure. They need something done. And the options that we currently have, medicines go up to a certain point. Our transplant plan is limited. LFADs are expensive and have and, and complications. So there really needs to be a, a better solution for heart failure. And I really believe that cell therapy will be one of these solutions. So from a practical aspect, if you tell people about this trial, I think you know, they will be informed and, and they can use this information because the actual patients that have this will be enrolling in trials that we will do in the network and other trials that will be happening they're ongoing. Dr. Holmes, building on uh, uh, to better trials is what we would call inside of baseball. What's your answer to the question of whether or not you would be willing to call it that? I think it, it should be reported. I think that it needs to be reported by you and Roger will report it, yeah. which is reasonably and rationally to say that there is great merit in this approach. We have sometimes let hype get ahead of science. Particularly stem cells. I agree with that. And I think that it is easy to grab onto that thing that says we're all stem cells waiting to happen or we've already happened or whatever it is that happened for. That there is clearly there is clearly something there. We are now working at the scientific underpinnings of finding out which cells, how to deliver them, which patients to make that difference. But I think we've, to a certain extent, gotten it backwards. I think we've talked about saying this is the holy grail stuff before we knew exactly what the holy grail was or how to get to that. But that would be my approach to it. This is still 
futuristic, that is true. We still have to get there, it's like putting a man on the moon. We'd like to put a man on the moon. We just, we're not there yet. We just need to move along. I don't know whether that helps you or not. I think it is very reasonable, and I think it's a great question um, that deserves considerable discussion, but I think I just now I reached science. But this trial group, the never said the rest of the trial group, is working with brings that scientific underpinnings back. And then begins the iterative process of finding out what, when, Roberto, we have you here. One of the discussions, do you want to add to that? Do you have a... Do we have a... Sure. Roberto Bowley was one of the discussions of that, and then we'll move on. Um, again, I don't want to discourage... No, but I just want to make sure that we have addressed these important issues, because that, uh, Roger, is an incredibly important issue. So I agree with everything you said about uh, the focus uh, since the event study, and I think it's an important step in us to try to understand how to best use the bone marrow. Uh, I personally believe there is a tremendous potential for the bone marrow to become therapeutically useful, but we are still at the very dawn of a tremendous revolution in cardiovascular medicine, for that matter, in every branch of medicine. Uh, and we still uh, have an enormous amount of uh, ignorance about what the bone marrow does and how it works. It's a very heterogeneous population made up of many different kinds of cells, and now we're starting, thanks to the insights also provided by the focus study, we are starting to understand that uh, the bone marrow in one patient is quite different from the bone marrow in another patient, uh, and that uh, the older the patient, the more incompetent the bone marrow becomes, Comorbidities have an effect on the bone marrow function and all the genetic factors, many other things we don't even know about that affect the ability of these bone marrow cells to produce new blood vessels and to help the heart. So uh, the, uh, the sub-analysis that um, Emerson showed this morning, they really give us some very tantalizing hints that we may be able to select out uh, patients in which bone marrow transplantation is therapeutically beneficial. And that will have to be done uh, before giving bone marrow cells by looking at uh, uh, a variety of functions of these bone marrow cells. Uh, the, for example, the tel telomere lens, telomere receptivity, the ability to form columns, as Emerson showed, the ability to survive oxidative stress, and so on. And that once we understand how these in vitro functions can predict the vivo efficacy, I, I think we will be able to select out those patients in which bone marrow transplantation is very helpful. And all of this is going to require a lot more research. Uh, clearly giving uh, you know, bone marrow indiscriminately to everybody um, is not going to produce a global uh, beneficial effect as Emerson showed this morning. But I think if we can select out uh, patients uh, <coughs> in which the bone marrow is still functional, we will see a beneficial effect. So in answer, Roger, to your question, we have hands. We don't have answers, but hence. Next. Uh, Shelley Wood with the heart.org and a much less profound question. It's just nuts and bolts for Dr. Link and Dr. Rhodes come up. What were your definitions of stroke in the trial? Is it a major stroke or was it stroke in TIA? It's all stroke. In our trial? Yes. In our trial, it was, was, a stroke. was a stroke, uh, including my major and minor, but uh, this study was, uh, was initiated before the bar, all the bar conditions, and uh, we, uh, we didn't really follow the, the first report of the study of the uncertainty-based these bar conditions. So loosely described major and minor stroke. Uh, in our study, what I reported was the rate of uh, strokes without TIA, and uh, for the 30 days follow-up, we had a total stroke rate of 2.9, major strokes of 1.2 and minor strokes of 1.7 and at the six months follow up 3.4% uh, of stroke 
with 1.6 being major and 1.8 being minor, and the TIA rate was 2.4 and 1.2 percent. Thank you. It's a crucial question uh, that we get sort of mixed up about because we're not sure exactly how to design it. We're not sure how to measure it, whether it be the fusion weighted MR, whether it be all of those things. Crucial question. Thank you. Next. I could go with ABC News uh, for Dr. Perry. Uh, but in regards to the two trials that were occurring, the focus trial and the focus HF trial, um, was there anything in that focus HF trial in regards to the age? Because I know that both were negative studies in regards to the primary endpoints. But did they do a separate analysis as you did in your trial? Yes, yeah, so focus HF was completed and it's, it's published in the American Heart Journal uh, last year. Um, and so it's a, it's a smaller study of 30 patients, 20 treated and 10 controls, and it, and it really hinted towards the issue with age. And so the median age, we divided the population the age of 60, and the younger patients had better function of the cells, and it was a very distinct better function of the cells. And these people, if you looked at MVO2, which I think is a really good evaluation actually, it evaluates not only the heart, but the whole body, Muscle, musculature, the vasculature, so the, the ability of the patient to perform. And we saw that that was significantly positively affected in these younger patients. Now, in the trial I presented today, a very similar thing showed up now in a large number of patients. We see in the thelocon colony forming cells. And if you just took that group, and I don't want to be sensationalistic here, but if you just took that group that had good ECFC function and, and the, the people that got treated and the people that that didn't, that were, that were placebo patients in that group of patients. If you look at the MVO2, which is something that we use to, to put somebody on the transplant list or take them off, the, the, the treated patients went from 14, which is the transplant number, to a 15 point something, which is, they got off the transplant list, and the placebos were 15 and went to 13, but they would have gone on the transplant list. So I'm not saying, that, you know, we don't need to generalize and say, oh, this is a therapy that will take you on and off the so these are the meaningful things that we're seeing and, and that maybe we can prospectively identify and then use that and select those patients and those cells and, and as Dr. Holmes was saying, really fine tune the therapy for the next generation of studies that are coming out. And just one more question. Um, in regards to um, those who had higher C median age in the study population of focus of CTR was 62. So on the age analysis, we took that median number and looked at the younger half and the older. Hi, um, Angelia Tolo with Dow Jones. I have a question for Dr. Lincoln. Um, can you put more context around a percentage of patients who need pacemakers, just why that was necessary? Was it consistent with previous data? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. Um, the pacemaker rate was uh, equivalent to those what had been reported for this kind of valve in different registries all across Europe, uh, with a rate of about 26%. Um, there's, um, we are still in the process of analyzing the data, and what we are realizing is that there is a, a huge difference depending on the country where the target has been performed. So there are countries with a uh, pacemaker rate of uh, 8%, there are other countries with a pacemaker rate of 30%. And given that the conduction system is probably pretty the same in the different countries, it appears that the, the uh, decision-making for implanting a permanent pacemaker differs a lot. So we are at the moment in the process of understanding why this difference is occurring between the countries. Um, can you sorry? Can you explain why the pacemaker is needed? Do you have any? Yeah, some of the patients experience conduction abnormalities, so their heart beats a little uh, slower than what is expected. This is not uncommon. It's also seen with conventional aortic valve replacement. It has been seen in a partner trial as well. But here the rates were a little lower, uh, a little higher as compared uh, to the partner study. Uh, however, they are lower than what has been seen, for instance, in, in the 
the German registry, uh, we had a pacemaker rate of 40% for the Medtronic core valve and of 20% for the Edwards valve. So there appear to be local differences in the countries, and uh, this is something we have to understand why those pacemaker rates are different. Next, how are you? Thank you. Uh, Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. Dr. Morrow, I know that you prefer uh, to do net clinical benefit. Would you address uh, never needed to treat and never needed to harm? The discussants brought it up, and sure. please give us numbers and address it. Yeah, no problem. So if you take the um, particular, the, those without a history of cerebral vascular disease in the weight above 60, the number needed to treat is 53 to avoid uh, one cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. And for the severe bleeding, uh, you would treat 333 patients before observing one severe bleeding event. And the rate for intracranial hemorrhage is treating 500 patients uh, for one increase in it. One occurrence of and uh, Dr. Holmes, could you address how that weighs out? That kind of a number needed to treat versus a number needed to harm? I think that it's a great question. I think that what we need to do is to, uh, rather than use the broad number, to use it for the specific patient that you're going to be treating. I think that uh, statistical things, number needed to treat, are terribly important for society incredibly important for economic reasons, but I think when we're faced with the patient in front of us, we need to say there is this risk um, that you face because you're the only one in this exam room that's going to get that drug. You're the only one that gets that. Uh, I don't get it. I can tell you about it. And then lay that up to them and educate them in that risk for that specific group. There will be some patients in whom David is talking about, you're not even going to bring that up. Patient with a prior stroke, you're probably you're not going to bring that up. Somebody that's never had a stroke, then you're going to bring that up and say, this looks like it has the potential for benefit and the potential for harm. And we need to then bring that together. And therefore, there will be some patients that say, that's easy to lay out. There will be other patients that say, gosh, I want to think about this, but this is what I want to do. Set. So I think we need to individualize it, and that's what we David is talking about. We wind up being healthcare givers, so that we then give that information because then the patient then is able to make that decision. That's not a dodge. I think that's reality. No, no, no. no sometimes that said is a dodge. I think um, in the era of patient-centric medicine. That's where we are at. We educate the patients, we talk with them about things, and then we give them the information so that they can make the best choice for them. I think the bottom line that everybody's sort of avoiding here, uh, maybe on our part, is, is this actually, do you really believe this is safe enough to, to be available to even make the choice? Fortunately, I don't, it doesn't matter what I believe, it matters what the FDA believes. I think that there will be some drugs that they will look at, and this may be one of those drugs that says, gee, to let that out into the public, where people don't take the great care that David and his team makes, would be too dangerous. There are other patients, there are other groups that might say they have to be taken care of in expert centers where they have the resources to educate the patients. I think for sending this out to every physician in every hospital setting to make it part of something that they pick up in the office on the way out is a bad, I don't think that's a good thing. I think that in very selected patients, in very selected, very good centers, this technology, this group of drugs offers the potential to improve outcome with an important safety hazard, however. But it's not for everybody. I, you might think differently than that. No, I, I agree with that as, as a concept. It's what we do already every day with our novel platelet agents that are already available to us. And actually, the numbers needed to treat and the risks are, are qualitatively actually pretty similar to some agents we're already using in our practice. And I think it's very 
very much, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Chris Kaiser with MedPage today. Uh, this question is for Dr. Rose Cabral. Uh, having identified the four factors that are predicted with long-term uh, mortality, uh, how does that impact patient selection going forward? Uh, unfortunately, I think that the number of patients evaluated do not allow us to give firm recommendations about a patient selection. But is, I would I would look at this as a first step, trying to uh, understand what is what we call this W risk CDR risk stratification. When we started with these procedures, we focused a lot on the technique, on uh, the, the performance of the, of the catheters, the valves, how to implant, how to position the valve. And we realized that we were treating patients uh, refused for surgery that were really sick. And uh, during the follow-up period, what we have seen is that uh, a significant number of these patients died within the months or within the first years following the procedure. And um, we have identified four, I think, important comorbidities that are very prevalent because many of these patients were refused because they had a severe COPD, oxygen dependent, and the surgeons didn't want to operate them. And um, we, we face the reality that these patients have many times a very bad prognosis. The way I see things is that in the next years, we will have to look at these with the larger numbers patients, uh, trying to really to establish this kind of uh, TAVR risk that could help to, for patient selection. And then uh, we, uh, well, for example, in our center, what has changed, when a patient has this kind of comorbidity, we evaluate very carefully the patient with an other specialist, for example, respiratory specialist, nephrologist, geriatricians are more and more involved in the evaluation of these patients. And I have to say that based on the results of the study, but also in our daily experience, we have been refusing more patients now than we were in the, in the past. As I said, this is a very first step with a relatively limited number of patients, but uh, a very first step in this nature. Next question. Um, Michelle Cortez with Bloomberg News for Dr. Rhodes I You said that about half were transfemoral and half were transatlantic. And your question was if there were any differences between? Right, any differences in how those patients fared? Mortality, stroke, subsequent cause of we, we, we reported these, uh, these uh, data uh, uh, in these two groups and we didn't find any significant differences in uh, clinical outcomes at 30 days and one year. We have looked at this at long term and we didn't find either differences between, uh, between the two two groups. Uh, this is our our experience. I know that in the other experiences have been uh, different. Maybe it's related also uh, to a uh, high experience in conceptual approach in Canada that uh, the, the technique started there. And, uh, and from the very beginning in this study we weren't able to find any uh, major differences between, uh, between the two groups, but my guess would be that in the next studies, the, uh, the, when, you advance, uh, when you have more long-term data, the two groups will tend to, uh, to equilibrate. These differences that you have seen in some of the studies between the two approaches, I think that our long-term follow-up, what comes the most is the comorbidities of the patients more than the approach. We don't have any phone questions. I must reiterate again the importance of you being here. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your tough questions. Tough questions are great questions. We then struggle with good answers to tough questions. And sometimes there aren't any good answers. We can give you approximations. We can give you approaches. But thank you for your questions. Thank you for your interest. Our patience. Thank you for your interest. The public thanks you for your interest. The speakers will be here. Rick Nishimura, Pat O'Gara, Doug Weaver here.